Welcome to the New Beginnings Assembly of God podcast. The following message was presented to the congregation at New Beginnings Assembly of God in Maryland Heights, Missouri, looking to discover joy, peace, and purpose in the scriptures that were brought forth. Thank you for listening, and we hope this podcast blesses you. We continue our way through the book of Matthew. I want to talk with you about courage in our times. Encouraged to stand up and just be who you are as a Christian in these days. Before I do that, I want to tell you about a guy. I'm going to call him Rex. That is not his name. If you are watching and your name is Rex, or if you're here and your name is Rex, I am not talking about you. But I have to give him a name, and I don't want to give him his real name, because what if he is watching? Several years ago, I was in Oakland, California, and we were in a great church there. And great church has a great mix of people. Very mature, wonderful, lovely people, immature people because people keep getting saved and growing in the Lord. And every great church has on occasion somebody that you keep praying the Lord will send to another church. (laughs) And Rex was that guy. Rex was super spiritual in quotes, meaning I'm not sure he'd met Jesus. But he had a way of forcefully and loudly belittling anyone who didn't agree with him about everything. He would constantly, boldly, without any tact, say whatever came to his mind. And then when people would call him on that, He would then run around saying, I am being persecuted as a follower of Jesus. He did develop a gift. I don't know if it was a spiritual gift, but it was something to behold. Because it was a larger congregation and the lobby or vestibule of the area was very large, when Rex would walk in, it was as if the church was reenacting the parting of the Red Sea. Because they knew that Rex was going to say something inappropriate, and if you mentioned it to him, he was going to then take it as a badge of honor for him being persecuted as a follower of Jesus. The pastor who had been there for several years and knew him very well had one of those voices that carries a long distance, unlike mine, very loud. His whispers were like a normal person's talking. Rex came to him after hurting someone's feelings. The pastor had seen it. And Rex came to say, Pastor, I've just been persecuted for following Jesus. I told so-and-so this, and they said something about me. Why must the righteous be persecuted? I'm not making it up. I watched this happen. The pastor, who is a very godly man, and you're not going to believe it from the statement I'm about to give you, but a very kind man, put his hand on Rex's shoulder and said, Rex, you are being persecuted, but not for Jesus. You're being persecuted for being a jerk. (laughs) Rex then went to another church and another church and another church and then started his own church in his living room and then he became the pastor and sole parishioner. But as long as I had known him, he maintained that he was being persecuted for righteousness' sake when he was just being persecuted because he was hard to be around. I say that because we are going to discuss today about living in challenging times where you as a Christian will be in a persecuted situation if you've not already experienced it. And I want to be very clear that we are to speak the truth, but we are to speak it in love. That we are to be gentle and kind, and as the Bible says, as far as it is on our shoulders, the manic's paraphrase, we are to live at peace with everybody. It is not our job to pick a fight. 
And so if you are living out your relationship with Jesus and loving people around you and finding yourself as the odd person out in social settings because of what you believe and espouse, understand in that case you are suffering a form of persecution and God will reward you for standing tall. We're going to see that today. The first section, and I know this is much longer than we normally do, but there's no way to split it up. The first section is verse 26 down to 31. And I want you to understand that your devotion to Jesus may put you in a position where you are being hurt by the world system. Two weeks ago we talked about the world system and how it operates. You just being saved will put yourself in a position where that world system which does not want to change may end up hurting you. Notice what we had read. Verse 26, therefore do not be afraid of them since nothing that is covered will remain covered but will become uncovered and nothing hidden that won't be made known. You've been in those settings if you're a vocal Christian. Now vocal doesn't mean rude. It just means you live out your faith out loud. You've been in those situations where you hear gossip about yourself. And I got to tell you, I've heard some rumors that were so good. I just stood there waiting to see what I did next. You will find that people will mistranslate what you say or take a portion of what you said and reword it to make you sound like a horrible, rotten person. And if you have any self-esteem at all, you want that rectified. And what Jesus promises is that when those who are unrighteous come against you verbally, that whatever is hidden, the truth in this case, will be made known. We do not have to defend ourselves. God will defend us. And I have found, sadly through personal experience, that sometimes trying to defend ourselves only makes it worse. But I'm wired for a good fight. And if, just pray for me. I'm, it's called sanctification. It's a process. And I'm having to learn over the years that it is better to let God fight Steve's battles than to Steve fight his own. And there is nothing that is hidden or secret that won't be disclosed. As you know, several years ago, they had a series of attacks on me because of my uh, love for those who are trapped in homosexual lifestyle. I work with them, I befriend them, I, I have several of them who are part of my life. And if that bothers you, all I can tell you is go meet Jesus, okay? Get over yourself. You can love somebody without advocating their lifestyle. And I think more people who are trapped in a lifestyle would come to know Jesus if fewer of us spent time beating up on them and just love them as creatures of God and let God fix them. <laughs> Several years ago, because of that, I uh, had a, <laughs> a lady who I'd made mad, and, and I did make her mad. Uh, she was wrong, and it was my job. And I didn't take joy in it. But you have to do your job. I mean, who wants a pastor who doesn't pastor? Amen. So she set out on a one-woman campaign to destroy me. And i got to give her credit. As you know, Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 10 says, Whatever your hand finds to do, you do it with all your might. And she lived out that verse. <laughs> and the rumors and the half-truths and the total lies... Uh, was really beginning to get me into some hot water and, and I was ready to be the Lord's hand extended in this situation and, <laughs> and fix the problem. <clears throat> My wife kept saying, Steve, you keep telling people let God fight their battles. You let him fight the battle. And I said, I, I will, honey, but doesn't he need somebody to be the soldier? <laughs> and she said, just practice what you preach. By the way, preachers hate hearing that. And it took a couple of years. But what was hidden, her motives and the truth, the Lord brought to full light. 
And the end of that has put me in a much better position to work with other individuals in different lifestyles than I ever would have had access to had this event not happened. Just because someone's coming against you doesn't mean you're wrong. It often means you're right. Don't fight your own battle. You go to God in prayer and let God take care of you because you're his kid. Then he says, verse 27, what I tell you in the dark, speak out in the light. And what you hear in a whisper, proclaim on the housetops. And that's why I'm so loud. I want to proclaim. That's not true. I'm just loud. (laughs) Not only will God reveal the motives of those who are attacking you, but in the midst of your life, God will whisper things into your life that others need to hear. When you're praying for each other, God will often give a word of encouragement or strength for the person you're praying And what do we do? We say, thank you, Jesus, and we don't do anything with it. When the Lord gives you a word of encouragement or strength for someone you're praying for, you need to shout it out. Now, don't, like, go to their door and shout at them. Send them in a text. And if you want to be a literal shouter, text them in all caps. The idea is that in the midst of our times of struggle and fight, often God's kids become so insular that we never look out to others who need Jesus. We're only looking out for ourselves. But as we are praying for, working with, and living amongst the unsaved, God will, the Holy Spirit, whisper things into your heart. He will speak things to your mind that are encouraging and helpful, and it is your job to speak those out. Several years ago, and I hate to say this, but the longer that I serve the Lord, more of my stories start with several years ago, because I never expected to live this long. Uh, People, one guy asked me once, why do you still ride a motorcycle? Aren't you too old for that? I said, I don't know. I've never been this old before. (laughs) Several years ago, I was with a group of of ministers, and we were doing what ministers do. We were eating donuts and drinking coffee. It was a meeting, but (laughs) that's why I was there. And ministers have a great ability to lead others and and disguise the pain that they go through. It says, well, that's hypocrisy. No, that's leading. But it's sad when ministers become so accustomed to that that we do it amongst ourselves because ministers are our support group. So we're in the middle of this, and a a neat fella, he now is a dean of academics for a Christian college out on the West Coast. He was sitting next to me, uh, weirder than I am. I love that guy. Looked at the fellow across the table from us. Sharp, successful, pastored a church bigger than uh, both of ours put together times three. Well polished, no facial hair. I mean, the man was a Christian. And I forget the exact words, but it was something like, hey. And he's just off the cuff. Hey. Just want to remind you God loves you. And I thought, that's nice, as I eat another bite of sprinkled donut. This well-quaffed gentleman who is still in our area, still doing a phenomenal job for Jesus, began to shake. Tears began to run down his face. And he began to just weep. He was so hurt, so broken, so devastated had he become so insular in his own life that he didn't even think he could speak to his friends about what he was going through. And the Lord spoke, whispered, to use our text, a word to my friend, and my friend just boldly proclaimed that to him, transformed that man's life. We live in challenging times as a Christian, but it does not give us the excuse to not engage and share the things that God whispers into our minds with those who need to hear it. And he says, verse 28, do not fear those who kill the body but are not able to kill the soul. Rather, fear him who is able to destroy both the soul and the body in hell. I'm just going to say it. If this is your first time, I apologize for 
sound like a jerk your first time. Normally I wait to like the third time. <laughs> I personally do not believe that the reason that American culture is the way it is is because of our government. And I don't think they're doing a great job, but I don't think that the moral decline, the destruction of family, the increase in internet pornography use, all of the sexual variations, I mean, it used to be male, female, gay, straight, now there's a whole alphabet, and people are still unhappy because there's not a letter that accurately portrays how they feel at that moment. The racial tension and hatred that we as a country were working and doing so well at overcoming seems to have reversed and now there's more division than there was before we had the movement. And I don't blame government for that. I don't blame media for that. I mean, those things don't help. I believe, based on Old and New Testament teachings about what God's people are called to do and how we're called to live, that America is in the spot that it is in is because the church has forgotten its job. We have feared those who could take away our tax-exempt status. We have feared those who will mock us publicly so we say nothing. We fear coming across as hate mongers so we don't share the love of Jesus. We come to our churches on Sunday and we raise both hands and we say hallelujah and when we leave we stick them in our pockets, keep our heads down and we try to avoid any kind of conflict so we can get back to church and talk about how good he is. If the unsaved world does not have a prophetic voice from Christian people, it will continue to spiral down and before Jesus comes this country will be destroyed. But there is another option. If we, and I don't just mean our congregation, and I'm not scolding you, I've seen you out in public. Y'all are rock stars. I don't mean you have long hair and you're addicts. I mean you're really good. <laughs> just wanted to be clear there. I've been with you and you didn't know I was looking as you discussed and encouraged and sometimes confronted in kindness. And I'm very proud of you. I'm speaking of the church as a whole in the United States of America. If we would start living what we believe, yes, they will come against you, but I got news for you. They're going to come against you anyway, just because you're saved. We have learned to fear those who can take from us everything but what truly matters, and that is our soul. But when we begin to fear God who has the ability to put us into heaven or hell and we begin to live accordingly, all of a sudden nobody can harm us. Amen. They might take your life, but that's just transferring you to a better place. Amen. I live on a nice street, but it's not a street of gold. Yep. I live in a nice house, but I got to make a payment all the time and fix stuff. It's horrible. <laughs> I love to eat and I bet they got better food in heaven. Why do we fear what could happen to us physically while we watch people who will spend eternity in hell and we do nothing? Challenging times make the difference between a real man and woman and an imposter. A real man, a real woman of God will stand up with grace and mercy and kindness and live out the love of God despite the flaming arrows verbally that may come. And we do so because we know what the unsaved doesn't. There is an eternity after this life and there is nothing in this life that is worth giving up an eternity in heaven. So he encourages us in these bad times. Don't be afraid of those who can take your life. You remember who the ultimate authority is. We're not going to finish this section. We would have if I'd used my notes. But I want to remind you in difficult times when nobody cares about you. Now don't raise your hand. I will because it's an example. But don't raise your hand. You've had those times when you didn't think anybody liked you. You've had those times when you did the right thing and the right motive and you got your head handed to you right on a platter. You've had those times when everything you did was for God and to help others and you came out looking like a horrible person. We've all had that time. I'm raising my hand. Don't raise yours. 
So why not? Well, we're online. I don't want to embarrass you. It's in those times, in challenging times, this is what God wants you to see, verse 29. Aren't two sparrows sold for a penny? Well, not in America because of inflation. They're like $59.95 now. But you get the idea. And yet not one of them falls to the ground without your father's consent. But even the hairs on your head have been counted. I have lived in this body for 55 years. I know, it looks like 20s. Wow, really? Laughter? See, now I'm being persecuted. But for righteous, new best friend. And I have had hair other than when I uh, shaved my head. Some of you knew me when I went through the bald head stage. I was boxing and thought it looked cool. My wife said, does not look cool. Um, so I have hair again. Because I'm the head of the house, I made that choice. And I have various forms of facial hair, whether it's a full beard, goatee, or you know, I have a week off and I just see what it looks like with mutton chops, stuff like that. I do all that stuff. <laughs> I've had 55 years to get acquainted with the hair on my head. And I hate to tell you this, I still don't know how many hairs I have. I just don't. Now, to be fair, it's never occurred to me to count them. With ADD, I am not sitting still long enough to count those hairs. And to me, the number of hairs on my head isn't that important. I mean, it's not. But God knows the number of hairs on your pastor's head. He knows me that well. He's concerned about me that well. And I got news for you, and this counts if you're bald. There's not an exemption clause. A bald friend of mine said, I'm not really bald. It just all moved on to my back. There's that mental picture to take home. You're welcome. If you're visiting, yeah, it does not get better. I don't even pretend. God knows the number of hairs on your head, and I dare say none of us know the number of hairs we have. <coughs> then he adds this line. So don't be afraid. You're worth more than many sparrows. Don't be afraid. Some of you already know this, that that phrase, don't be afraid. Now, if you're a King James person, fear not. Amen. Right? And I like the King James on that one. Just it sounds cool to me. And if you get all uptight about, well, is it this one or that one? It's neither. It's Greek. So there you go. Fear not. Notice the context of fear not here. People are going to be mad at you. People are going to make fun of you. You're going to get excluded from the parties you want to go to at times. People are going to make up stuff about you. Amen. And if you lived my life, they're going to bring up stuff that you actually did do and wish nobody knew. Yeah. But we still need to live for Jesus because people still need to know him. He is still the freedom that we're looking for. He's still the one who breaks the bonds that we carry. He's still the one that sets us as prisoners free. He is still the one that brings life to death and joy to unhappy situations. He is still the one that gives us peace that passes understanding. And by the way, I'm not making this up. The Greek there, peace that passes understanding, the idea is peace that makes people think you don't know what's going on. Fear not. In the Old and New Testament, it's not a coincidence. It is listed 365 times. Now, this isn't why it's listed 365 times. Let me just make this point for you. That's one time every day, every year. You don't have to be afraid any day. Now, if you're like I am, you're already thinking it, but you're too Christian to say it, so I'll say it. Well, what about leap year? <laughs> I'm getting eyes rolling at me if you're listening to the podcast. 
Do not, you're not saved that day, someone said. Do not be afraid. Look, our world is challenging and our world does not like Christian values. But God does. And last time I checked, we were in his kingdom and not the kingdom of the world. And nobody gets saved by Christians acting like the world, being backbiters and vicious and cruel and self-centered. We get people saved by living out the kingdom, which is to love God with everything we've got and to love our neighbor as ourselves. And on those days when the world is against you and you're ready to crawl into the covers and turn Netflix on and order an extra large pizza and eat it all by yourself, the Lord would speak to you and say, I know how many hairs you have on your head. You don't. I love you more than you love yourself. I know more about you than you know about yourself. And here's what I want you to know. Stop being afraid. Our world needs Christians who just live Jesus. Not religion, not New Beginnings Assembly of God, even though they're the greatest church in America. We got one amen, which is kind of sad. And it was from the youth pastor, so he's obligated. Second amen, now I'm humble. They need Christians who just say, this is what I was before Jesus found me. And yeah, I'm still kind of a jerk sometimes. But I'm so much better than I was before Jesus. And, and if you know him well enough, he's saying, you know, you're kind of a jerk now. But Jesus can make you better than what you are if you'll give your life to him too. And on those days when you're ready to give up, throw in the towel and call it a day, God would speak to you and say, don't be afraid. You're right where I want you to be doing what I want you to do, saying what I want you to say. You hang in there. You be faithful and your reward will be great. If you're here today watching or listening to the podcast and you're not a Christian, I'm not offering you a bed of roses. I'm not offering you come to Jesus, you'll never have a problem again. What I am offering is if you come to Jesus, you're going to have joy, peace, and purpose in this life. And when you die, hell will not be your destination. Heaven will. And you won't have to go through a day of fear ever again if you choose to. Because he'll be there to say, fear not. So if you're here today watching or listening, you're ready to give your life to Christ, pray this with me. And let's give your life to Jesus. Father, forgive me for living my life as if you don't matter. Come into my life and be my God. I'm going to serve you the rest of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Now, if you've prayed that here watching, tell somebody because God always seems to bless you when you do. Now, Christian, a couple of takeaways from today. Number one, never apologize for being who you are. You make a mistake, you apologize for the mistake, but you don't try to pretend that you didn't make it. Don't apologize for who you are. You're a broken, messed up person that Jesus loves. Number two, don't forfeit the opportunity to live Jesus just because somebody's not going to like it. God will bless you in this life and in the life to come. And you will be able to say, as Paul did, I have fought the good fight of faith. Whatever you're doing today, I'm going to need you to remember two very important truths. Number one, God loves you very much. And number two, regardless of how many hairs I have on my head, I am proud to be your pastor. The Lord be with you. <laughs> Thank you for listening to today's message presented by New Beginnings Assembly of God in Maryland Heights, Missouri. Please subscribe or like the podcast on whichever platform you are using. Share it with your friends as well as rate and review it so others who are looking to discover a lifestyle of joy, peace, and purpose can find us as well. And as Pastor Steve likes to say, whatever you're doing, remember this, because of Jesus, life is good today.